Test. Hello, everybody. This is uh, Steve Higgins. Uh, I'm from Rolls Battery Engineering. Uh, we're a couple minutes early, uh, so it's uh, about three minutes too. We're going to give it another four or five minutes before we start, so we can get as many folks uh, in the door as possible. Um, hold tight, and uh, it'll be a few minutes. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Steve Higgins. Uh, welcome to the Rules Battery Engineering uh, webinar on troubleshooting battery banks. This is the first, uh, basically what I call the troubleshooting one. This is the first webinar on basic troubleshooting. Uh, a couple of weeks, we're going to do another one on some load testing. Uh, just a couple things on the interface, depending on how you're viewing. Uh, if you look at your screen, uh, if you're viewing on Google Plus, if you're looking, if you look at your screen. Um, on the screen itself, uh, across the top bar, it'll say Rolls Battery Engineering Troubleshooting 1, uh, your name, your Google login, and then there's going to be a row of blocks. If you, if you click on that, it'll say either Showcase or Q&A. If you select Q&A, uh, at that point in time, you can, you can type questions that we can respond to. Um, uh, that gives you an idea of how to get into that. Um, uh, if you are, unfortunately, if you are viewing on YouTube at this point in time, um, YouTube does not allow you to um, to enter, to, to ask questions at the time. So um, hopefully in a couple of weeks they have that up. Uh, from what I hear, uh, YouTube, uh, when I do the troubleshooting 2 directly on YouTube, it will allow for comments and questions and stuff like that during the presentation. 
Um, again, my name is Steve Higgins. Uh, this webinar is about troubleshooting battery banks. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, I'll be more than happy to answer those. Just a couple of housekeeping items I like to do before every webinar. Uh, because this is live streaming to YouTube and Google+, uh, the broadcast is about 15 to 20 seconds delayed. So if you do have a question and you type in the question, um, uh, give, it, give me some time because uh, I'm probably 20 seconds, 20, 30 seconds ahead. Uh, I do have everybody's microphone muted so we don't get an echo. Um, uh, there's actually about 20 or 30 slides uh, we're looking, and of course I didn't complete my thing here, so but we're probably looking at 30 to 40 minutes at, at worst. Um, and of course I've already addressed the hangouts on air. Um, so if you don't have access to the chat pane, you can email me your comments at steve at .com. Um My here's my contact information. Uh, my direct phone numbers, uh, my email addresses. Feel free to email me, uh, and I'll be more than happy to take care of you. Um, this is be re being recorded on YouTube. Uh, the email that I sent to everybody, there's a link that you can go back and rewatch it, or if you just do a search for Rolls Battery Engineering YouTube channel, uh, this one and all the past webinars will be on there. Um, first thing about batteries is. Uh, Batteries are much like, are manufactured much like electronics of today. Um, uh, typical battery uh, is not, you know, your, most battery manufacturers, they see less than a quarter percent real true warranty failure rate. Uh, generally with Rolls battery, we replace about 1% of our total production per year. Most of that, 75% of that 1% is what we call gratis or uh, trying to take care of the customer, making sure, you know, making trying to keep things, keep customers from having problems. Um, uh, of the batteries that we bring back, less than a quarter percent of those batteries are actually a warrantable failure. Um, generally what happens in these systems is, uh, and I do this usually live, batteries don't die, they're murdered. Um, the biggest problem with batteries in general, uh, lead, lead type batteries, is that if you let them if you don't charge them, you don't cycle them, especially late antimony batteries, you're going to have problems. Um, and so what, what that causes is it causes people to be disheartened and they start moving on trying to look for different, more expensive battery technologies and and then, uh, uh, you know, they just end up battery shopping. So uh, these these webinars are trying to prevent, trying to prevent that. Um, when you're dealing with batteries, the first thing that's very important to understand is is you need to understand how a battery works. Um, it's it's very important to understand how the battery works. Basically, what's going on with a battery is is a chemical reaction. It's much like your body. Uh, if you decide that you're going to sit and watch uh, football or basketball, or you're going to sit in the house and be a couch potato for six eight months of the year, when you decide that you want to go out in the summertime to go out and enjoy the weather and and play, you're going to you're going to notice that your body doesn't react to physical ex ex exertion like it did in September when you were, you know, coming down off the summer. So, uh, and that's what a lot of these systems go is you get, you get customers or clients, especially if it's an off-grid cabin that's uh, weak in seasonal use. Uh, the battery spends six months being, you know, not being charged, not being cycled. Customers show up in, in April or May or June, and then they expect the batteries to work like they did in, in September. Um, that just doesn't, uh, isn't really the best. So um, basically what you have for chemical reactions is you have you, inside of a battery, basically you have a, a jar with a, a positive plate, which is made up of lead oxide. Uh, you have a negative plate, which is made of lead. And then those plates are sitting in a vat of sulfuric or a, a jar with sulfuric acid in it. Okay. Um, as you are discharging those batteries, uh, basically you start with lead oxide positive plate. You start with a, uh, a lead negative plate. And of course, that's sulfuric acid. Um, as the battery is discharged, the chemical reaction that's going on within the battery, it's turning that lead plate into a lead sulfate plate. Okay, same thing both the positive and the negative. You're releasing electrons in the form of energy going to your loads, uh, and you're creating heavy water. So now what you have is on the positive plate, you have PbSO4, and you have 2H2O, uh, basically, which is lead sulfate and heavy water. And then, of course, on the negative plate, you have lead sulfate. Um, uh, so that's the discharging of a battery. 
to recharge, everything works in reverse. Basically, what you have there is you, you start with lead sulfate plates, you run electrons, you, you run electrons, you add your electrons by charging the batteries. That pushes the, the sulfate, the, the, the SO4, here, I'll even highlight it, um, that pushes the SO4 off of the negative plates, off of the plates themselves, and that SO4 repopulates back into the H2SO4, okay? And so basically, every time you charge or discharge a battery, um, you're going to leave a little bit of sulfate on the battery, and that's basically what what uh, what what makes the battery life limited. Because the 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 every time you cycle, you're going to leave a little bit of sulfate on that. So that's that's where you measure your cycles. So it's very important to understand uh, how that how that battery works. Otherwise, you're gonna you're gonna run in, you're gonna run into problems. Um, um, Move on. So, just some basic battery facts: uh, 12 volt battery bank, six cells; 24 volt, 12 cells; 48 volt battery bank has 24 cells. Uh, when you call me and I, you want me to tell you what charging voltage is or what the voltage measurements, I'm typically going to give you a, give you a, a volts per a volts per cell number. Uh, for example, 2. Point, like 2.13 volts per cell. Uh, 2.13 volts per cell is a fully charged and resting no load situation okay and what this means is is that if the battery voltage is fully charged and resting uh, and it's been sitting there with absolutely no load on it you should measure about 2.13 volts for a full charge battery or 12.78 volts or depending on what size what size battery bank you're dealing with 12 24 volt yada 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 okay um, so a discharged 100% battery under resting no load will measure 1.75 volts per cell. Now, 1.75 volts per cell is equivalent to 10.5 volts uh, for a 12 volt system, 21, 20, 20, 21 volts for a 24 volt system, and 42 or 42 volts basically for a 48 40 volt system. Okay, so this is 100% depth of discharge. If you're taking your batteries as pretty much any battery down to this point, 100% depth of discharge, uh, and you look at the cycle life charge, even, even for lithium batteries, you're looking at uh, uh, a very low overall cycle life for that specific battery. Um, last but not least, uh, we have a less than resting voltage of two volts per cell, uh, which means if I measure my battery voltage and it measures two volts per cell and I have no load on that battery, that means that that battery is at 50% state of charge. So you have somewhere between 2.0 and 2.13 resting voltages. Uh, unfortunately, with most of our systems, it's very difficult to measure uh, resting voltages uh, because your customers don't want to, uh, uh, they don't want to have, they don't want to not have power. So when you're doing troubleshooting, you can set up the uh, a bypass switch to turn on the generator, bypass that to the loads while you're doing maintenance or, or, or troubleshooting the battery bank. In general, uh, flooded battery banks uh, need to see a full charge uh, at least every 20 to 30 days. And this full charge is based on uh, how often you're cycling it. If you're cycling it every single day, if you're cycling it more often, uh, the batteries are struggling. Uh, you may want to you may want may want to make sure that you get a full 100% charge more often. Um, that's just something you might want to look at. Uh, absorb glass mat or tubular gel batteries. Generally, they need to see a charge about once a week. Um, if your batteries are sitting in a deficit cycling for for long periods of time, what will happen is is that uh, the, the, you'll lose uh, you lose sulfate out of the electrolyte. Uh, the lead plates will sit in water, and you do not want that. We'll get into that why that's a problem a little bit later. All right, so common causes of failure. The number one cause of failure, the biggest issue that I see talking to every single customer that I talk to on uh, a weekly basis, uh, you know, 8, 10, 12, 15 phone calls a day is undercharging. And generally, it's incorrect charging parameters. Um, uh, as a battery manufacturer, we can tell you to charge your batteries at 2.4 or 2.45 or 2.5 volts per cell, 
the problem is is that we don't know how that customer is going to use that system. Um, often, what will happen is, is the system will be, be being used heavier or lighter than designed, and your charging parameters will differ from where the manufacturer has asked you to set them to. So what you want to do is you want to adjust your charging parameters based on what your monthly specific gravity reports, and we'll talk more about that a little later on. The same goes for absorption times. Sometimes if you, it's better to have a longer absorption time if you can than a higher voltage. So um, another issue is uh, for undercharging are your set it for your set it forget it customers and installers, otherwise known as taillight guys, taillight installers. And this would be you know basically customers who set up the system and they leave it set up and they leave it in the same place regardless of what time of the what time of the year it is, uh, what their battery conditions are, and they expect everything to be a okay. Uh, unfortunately, the products that today, even today, uh, between Schneider, Outback, Xantrex, or I'm sorry, uh, Schneider, Outback, uh, uh, Midnight, um, uh, Morningstar, Magnum, uh, the products aren't that smart yet. They aren't 100% adjustable where they're going to self-adjust based on what your what your capacities are. Uh, matter of fact, a lot of the shunt meters like the FlexNet DC from Outback, the battery, the BMK from Magnum, the battery status meters from Snyder's, a lot of these meters have have inherent problems where they can they can be confused and 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 misread information or uh, if your battery is already sulfated and you plug it in and start it up or or if it's not charged fully when you start up, um, there can be issues down the road. So be very careful with them. So second co common cause of failure is of course lack of lack and port maintenance. Um, and part of that is uh, the big part of that is is overwatering or underwatering. If you run the batteries dry, um, that can be an issue. But it can be even worse if you're overwatering because if you're overwatering and you overwater water for too long, then what will happen is is the uh, uh, you'll start to dilute the amount of electrolyte that's in the battery. You dilute that electrolyte. Uh, you reduce the amount of sulfate that's in the battery. You're gonna you're gonna over a period of time reduce the amount of uh, capacity your battery has. So um, you know it's actually better to water more often and keep the water level a little lower than it is to overwater and not water as often. Um, the next one would be uh, connections. Uh, connections are always fun. Um, you know we get my get a few pictures a year with people with uh, burnt connections because uh, the you developed a high resistive connection and then the, the high resistive connection created heat the heat causes the terminal to melt and then the melting could ignite the hydrogen or even cause a fire on the cable there's a lot of problems uh, when you're checking your connections you don't want to do what I call the tug test go and tug on all the tape cables and, and hope that they're tight uh, put a wrench on them uh, put a wrench on it, back it off a half a turn, and retighten. Um, you know, if you're worried about how tight they are, you can you can uh, you can tighten them to the to the torque specifications. But realistically, most customers should be putting a wrench on their on all their connections at least once every nine to twelve months. Um, the next uh, common cause of failure is excessive heat, um, improper positioning of temperature. Uh, basically, for Generally, you must, you should always, always, no matter what, no matter if you live in Seattle or if you live in the Bahamas or if you live in, in Sierra Leone or if you live in the UK, you should always be using a temperature, a battery temp sensor. And the reason for that is the purpose of a battery temp sensor is to measure the temperature of the batteries and to adjust the charging voltage based on that temperature of the batteries. If you're not using a battery temp sensor, you're never charging the batteries properly ever. So you should really always be using some sort of battery temperature sensor on your chargers. Um, uh, so uh, improper positioning of the temp sensors. Um, I can't tell you how many sites I've gone to where the temp sensors have been mounted to the top of the battery. Um, if, it, if the temp sensor is designed to be put to, mounted to the post, that's great. You can do that. But generally, the temp sensors are, are designed to be mounted to the side of the battery, uh, and the manufacturers put uh, like a double-sided sticky tape on it. Um, I was just at a site about a month and a half ago. Temp sensors were dangling between the batteries and weren't even making contact. 
it's not doing any good. It's not measuring any temp, any 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 temperature at all, uh, or it's measuring ambient temperature, and so your charging voltages are off. Um, so you want to try to make sure that you 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 put the temp sensors about half to halfway to a third of the way down below. You want you want the, the sensor below the level of the plates and on the side of the battery. Uh, what I will do is I'll usually run a a uh, couple uh, rounds around the battery of electrical tape or duct tape to hold the sensor onto the side of the battery to make sure it doesn't fall off. Um, outdoor installations. Uh, this is a big problem. Um, uh, I see a lot, actually the, both of these, outdoor the outdoor installation, poor choice of installation location. Um, again, the site I was at uh, about a month ago, uh, generator exhaust fed right into the battery room. And so whenever the generator ran, the battery temperature got above 50 degrees C every single time. Uh, that's cooking the batteries. Um, remember, with a with a flooded lead acid, with a lead acid battery of any type, really, if they want to operate. The chemical reaction is going to happen best at 25 degrees Celsius. When you're at 35, 45, 50 degrees Celsius, your chemical reaction doesn't happen as efficiently. So your batteries aren't efficient, aren't as efficient. Okay. The other issue is is that with higher temperatures you're going to lose cycle life from a 25 to a 35 degree, just a 10 degree swing in delta on, on temperatures, you're losing half of your cycle life. So those batteries, if they remain at 50 degrees C for 12 months a year, they're losing about 75% of their battery life um, just based on the temperature of those batteries. So the battery should be installed in a cool, dry environment, um, you know, typically between 20 and 30 degrees C is where you want to try to keep them while they're going to operate best at 25 degrees C. Um, so the next cause of failure that we see a lot uh, is overcharging, primarily over equalizing. Um, uh, I talk to a lot of folks uh, on the phone. I talk to a lot of folks at trainings and events, and they tell me, yeah, I've equalized once every month for the, for the last 24 months without fail, and the batteries, for some reason, don't seem to be holding a charge. Um, uh, equalization is typically done in two cases. Equalization is done when your specific gravities are more than 25 to 30 points in difference, which means if your specific gravities are uh, 1.210, 1.240, 1.260, 1.190, if the battery's specific gravities are all over the place, that is when you equalize. That's why, as battery manufacturers, we call this equalization is because you're you're overcharging the batteries intentionally to try to help balance out the specific gravities. If if you're doing this all the time and it's not required, you're actually causing more harm to the batteries than good because your batteries are going to react better to a, a lower, longer, or a lower voltage, longer charge than a higher voltage, shorter charge. So. Um, you know, try to start, e try, try to focus more on getting the correct bulk and absor absorption times at the proper voltages than trying to tell your customers just to equalize because it's not a fix all. Um, uh, then of course the last incorrect charging parameters, um, you know, uh, I, that's a, that's a big issue. Uh, you want to try to avoid that. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit in a second. Um, Last but not least, too many connections. Um, this is basically five parallel strings of, let's say, six volt batteries for 24 volt battery bank. Um, uh, so basically, each battery has 0.00144 ohms of internal resistance. And you add those up, basically, each string should have roughly about 0 0.005 or 0 0.006 ohms of resistance. And that's not including your cables. Okay. The problem is, is not every battery is created equal. Um, you can get ba some batteries that are a little higher, some batteries a little lower. So uh, a lot of times if you get mismatches in different batteries, you'll actually get string imbalance charging issues. So generally, if we put 100 amps of current, um, ideally, if Ohm's law is working correctly and all of our resistances are pretty close, you're going to see roughly around 20 amps per string for each internal resistance. For 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 each pair, each string, that's great. The problem is, is that when you start hooking up too many parallel strings, if you get a little bit higher resistance on one of your strings, like for example the second string, so let's say the resistance is just two thousandths of a point higher than the 
than the rest of the strings, because current's lazy, it's going to go the path, the path of least, least resistance. I call a current kind of like my teenager. I, had a, I have a teenage, well, he's not a teenage son anymore, but when he was, he did everything he possibly could to do it the, the easiest and the least resistive way, just like current. Um, and so what's going to happen now is that the, the other four strings are, are going to draw uh, the current that they need. They're going to draw a little bit more current than the rest of the, rest of the strings. And so what's going to happen is that string one is going to, going to draw a decent current, string, string three, string four, string five, it's going to draw a decent current, while string two doesn't charge as well. Now, the problem is that during charging, the problem is, is once the charger goes away, well, there's two, twofold. Once that charger's charging source drops, now string two feeds off of the rest of the battery bank. And that's not a good thing for the, for the batteries in general. The other issue is, is with voltage control chargers, if your currents and you say, say you've got higher current going into the four parallel strings, so your voltages goes a little higher on those, on those, the voltages get to get to bulk and absorption faster. That tricks the charger into going to absorb too quick, which means your batteries never see a full charge. So it's, it's just a problem that, 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 that will perpetual, perpetually cause a problem. Um, a lot of customers, when they when I when I talk to them about this, they complain. Well, I, I did it this way because you know I'm, you know it was it was cheaper to do it this way. I could they, I could get a 2,000 amp hour battery bank without 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 uh, without spending a whole lot of extra money. Yes, upfront cost is cheaper, but your maintenance costs and your overall lifetime costs actually increase. Um, Typically, if you go one to two parallel strings of batteries, your overall maintenance maintenance costs are going to be much less than if you're doing four or five, six parallel strings of batteries. Not to mention, if we go back to the previous slide, uh, we have we have 24 cells. Actually, we have this is 24 volts. We have 12 cells that we have to maintain here. So we've got 12 cells on string one. We've got 12 cells on string two. 12 cells string three. 12 cells string four. 12 cells string five. That means we have 60 cells that we have to maintain. If we just had a single series string of batteries that had the 2,000 amp hour capacity, now we're only maintaining 12 cells. It's a whole lot less time of taking specific gravity measurements and taking care of your battery bank than it is to have, I mean, I don't know many customers who are gonna go out and make 60 specific gravity measurements every you know, four to six months, if ever. Um, so. Uh, try to keep things as simple as possible for your clients. So troubleshooting, um, troubleshooting symptoms. Uh, these are probably the top four symptoms that I see. Um, number one, lack of capacity. Um, number two, uh, low, no or excessive water use. Uh, basically, you get in, you get cells that are not using any water, or cells that are overusing water. Um, we'll talk about each one of these individually. Um, excessive or, excuse me, or imbalanced cell heating uh, or excessive gassing. Um, literally, if you're seeing smoke and gas just coming, burst coming, you know, you know, over pressurization coming out of the battery, then you know you definitely have got a problem with the battery there. Um, but when you start seeing uh, one cell, you know, 5, 10, 15 degrees Celsius warmer than, you know, cell 2 or, or cell 10, uh, you know, you might have a, a plate issue or a separator issue with inside the battery. Then, of course, specific gravity readings, either all low or all over the place. Um, uh, we'll talk about these once I get more to the examples. Um, talk a little about specific gravity. Um, with with rolls, specifically with rolls throughout batteries, um, our batteries are spec'd out, like most companies, at 1280 specific gravity, 1.280 is is considered the, uh, the the spec capacity. The problem with that is if you operate your battery at the spec capacity, as the battery ages, it's naturally the specific gravity is going to increase. So the hotter you run the the hotter you run the specific gravity or the richer that specific gravity is, uh, the less overall life you're going to have in that battery. So generally with a with a with a with a renewable application, most customers are going to operate about 1265 to 1275 for a renewable energy application. And this is based on how often that customer is going to 
This is, oops, I hate it when it does that. This is based on how often that customer is going to is going to charge the batteries. Um, one of the things to watch out for is, uh, and there you go, my, now my pen's working, is on the low end, the 1255 to 1265 range, um, that's typically assuming that you're getting, uh, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours of charge per day. I mean, that's generally an industrial application. If you're going to, if you've got an industrial application for these batteries, like a forklift battery or a, or a rail battery, 1255 to 1265 is about where you want to be with these batteries. But because generally with a renewable application, you really only have four, five, six hours of, of decent charge per day unless you've got a tracker, um, you want to operate a little bit higher specific gravity so you have a bit more capacity to work with. Um, so that's something to watch out for. Um, I actually this I actually put this new slide in for this presentation. Uh, I get folks calling me up all the time asking me uh, where this chart because it used to be on our manual and it was pulled out because it's a it's a it's a bit ambiguous. Um, because again, we go back to open cell readings to really know, you know, you really need to have an open cell, fully charged, under no load recommendation, okay? And so 2.13 volts, 12.78 volts for, and this is under no load, open cell, no inverters, no charge controllers, nothing connected to the batteries. Um, and it's typically you're looking at one to two hours of rest. And most of us don't have the time to do that. So 12.7, 12.8, 25.6, 34.8, oh, or 34.1 and 51.1, generally open open cell voltage measurements of, of uh, using as the indication of health. Um, the next voltage measurement would be under a C10 discharge rate. Basically, you're, you're, you're loading the battery at a 10 hour discharge rate and these are estimate estimate estimations based on the percent of charge versus the 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 amount of load that you're placing the battery. So generally under load, typically when you get to about 1.85 volts per cell or even 1.9 volts per cell under load, that's generally your 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 where your start stop your your, your automatic generator start setting should be set to right around that area if you want to try to keep in that 50% capacity range. So, um, so sulfation. Um, I get a lot of folks that when I talk to them about sulfation, they panic. Um, and there's not a reason, there's not really, sulfation is a natural occurrence with a battery, unfortunately. If you were to take a brand new fully charged lead acid battery or a brand new battery of any type and take it off the charger, it immediately starts to sulfate, and basically what's happening is is that your your the self discharge of the battery is causing sulfation, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, leaving sulfation on a battery for long periods of time is a bad thing, and so you want to try to make sure you do full charges to 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 get rid of that. A little bit of a fun fact is. Lead is soluble in water, okay? What that means is, is that if a, if a battery is being lead, left in a state of discharge for too long, the lead plates actually begin to dissolve. Um, and that's where you lose some of your capacity. So um, you've got to be careful there. So the, 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 you know, typically it's cheaper to charge a battery than it is to replace a battery because you left it in a state of discharge for too long. So... Uh, when you're when you're checking the health of the batteries, you really want to to use voltage along with specific gravity, loaded voltage, unloaded voltages, and specific gravity, all three to give you a basic understanding of how the batteries operate. So, a um, couple of couple of this is a couple of pictures of some plates. Uh, what we have here is we have a uh, well-formed positive plate. Um, uh, basically, you see a uh, little bit of sulfation, you know, sprinkled throughout the battery. Uh, basically, it's a well-used plate. You don't see, you see some some uh, some uh, active material loss in the plate. Not a huge thing. We go to this battery here, this this plate here, this white area, all this white here, 
is sulfate. And what that sulfate is doing is it's reducing the capacity of your battery by covering up the, the, the active material on the plates. And you, you lose that surface area, you lose, you lose power, you lose capacity. The only way to remove that is to properly charge the battery or to start equalizing the batteries. The more and more you equalize those batteries, the more and more problems you're going to cause with overheating and over temperature of the batteries, and you'll see what that looks like in a second. Some symptoms of sulfation. Uh, the primary symptom for sulfation is during charging, uh, typically in the bulk charge phase. Uh, if you have your customer watch how uh, how often the, the uh, how long the batteries are in bulk, uh, typically brand new batteries. Say you got a thousand amp hour battery bank with a hundred amp charger. Uh, typically, your bulk phase is 45 to, to 75 minutes. Um, that's the amount of time it takes to get from 2 volts per cell up to 2.45, 2.48, to 2.5 volts per cell. Um, uh, on a sulfated battery, what you'll see is you'll see that voltage go from 2 volts per cell to 2.45 volts per cell or even 2.5 volts per cell very, very quickly. Usually, you know, 10, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. Um, while at the same time, you'll see your specific gravity recordings all pretty much, pretty, pretty much consistently low, or they'll be all over the place. You'll start seeing, you know, large differences between specific gravities. Generally, how to fix sulfation? Is you need to adjust your settings. You need to adjust your settings and focus on doing proper bulk absorption and, and, and charge times. Uh, maybe you need to extend your absorption chines, times and cycle the batteries. Uh, what I would do, what I typically have people do, is I'll have them do a, a, a 2.47 to 2.5 volts per cell uh, absorption, extend the absorption time an hour to two hours, making sure that they top off water at least once every couple of weeks. Um, and I'll, I'll have them do that for you know two, three, four weeks, trying to focus on doing it. At least once a day, once every two, you know, once every couple days, uh, and and focus on cycling and basically cycle or charge, charge, discharge, charge, discharge, charge. Try to focus on and basically giving that battery the exercise to do that. Um, uh, if the batteries don't respond, if you don't see a 15, 20 point jump in specific gravities and a, and a better capacity, um, if you at that time, you would perform uh, a corrective equalization to try to speed up the process, mining, keeping keeping uh, keeping a track, keeping track on how much your temperature is rising while you're doing it. Uh, again, you want to try to keep keep the temperature of the batteries as cool as possible. Uh, some preventative me measurements um, for troubleshooting for 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 sulfation: uh, record retain specific, specific gravity readings. You know, once a quarter. You know, once every three, every once every two, three months. Go in and, and, and check your specific gravities of all the cells. If you have 12, 24, you know, 24, 48 cells, uh, you can even spot check. If you have 48 cells, two strings of two strings in a 48 volt configuration, then what you can do is you can you can check the even numbered cells and the uh, on the even numbered months, or or check the odd number cells and the odd months, and that way you you at least have some sort of history. Batteries generally don't just up and die overnight. Batteries Typically, you'll start seeing specific gravities falling off on one cell, and either charging or equalization doesn't recover the cell. That's a battery. That's a cell on its way out, the, on its way to failing. Um, what ends up happening with most customers is it fails. The voltage drops to if it, a two volt cell drops down to one volt or even less, and now the generator starts turning on at night, and that's that's when the customer calls the electrician. Um, or the installer um, manually you know preventative measures back again make you can extend your absorption timers uh, absorbing a battery absorbing a lead acid battery all of this doing is gassing it's not really doing much more it's not harming the battery so it's typically not a big deal um, so manually verify and then in the last but not least manually verify that you're getting you're, you're getting to a full charge uh, at least a full 100% as a state of charge by looking at your specific gravities every 20 to 30 days. All you got to do is go out there and spot check it. Um, you know, you go out, you check half a dozen cells, they're all 1265, 1275, 
at, at 25 to 30 degrees Celsius, you're close. It's not, it's not a huge deal. You go out and spot check and you see 1220s, 1240s, you know, even low 1250s, then you might have to, to make some changes to your charging parameters. Um, cell heating. Uh, one of the things you want to do is when you're when you're when you're charging your battery specifically is when the most heat's going to happen within your batteries. And what you want to do is is get yourself an infrared temperature sensor or thermometer to measure, you know, a little laser pointer thermometer. They're about twenty five thirty bucks at Lowe's or Home Depot or your local hardware store. Get one of those um, while you're going through a bulk or absorb and equalize. Go through and measure the cell, the individual cell temperatures. Um, you start seeing, you know, cells on average of 30, 32 degrees C under charge while one cell's cooking along at 40 to 45 degrees C. Um, you may have a problem developing there. Um, or in the reverse, you see 30, 30, 32, 32, 35 degrees Celsius temperatures while the uh, one cell's down at 20 or 25 degrees C. Um, you know, uh, the nice thing about that, that that infrared temp sensor, it can also be used to find loose connections. Um, uh, I, I had a site I went to, um, geez, must have been six, seven years ago now. A uh, customer had two parallel strings, and one string, specific gravities were all 1260, 1270, great. The second string, all the specific gravities were 1220, 1230. Uh, it turned out that one of the connections I had, 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 had loosened up and had welded, and so it felt like a tight connection, but as soon as you put a wrench on it and backed it up, backed up the bolt, retightened it, um, the, the, it, it was obviously loose. So we ended up pulling the connection, cleaning it, uh, uh, cleaning it with the, cleaning the actual connection, cleaning up the lead, uh, reconnecting it, retightening it. And, uh, the next charge cycle, the, the temperatures didn't get more than a degree or two out from the rest of the battery bank. So it's a, it's a good way to troubleshoot, uh, cable issues or connection issues. Um, and lack of excessive water use, use kind of is the same thing. Uh, again, may indicate a, a, a failed or a shorted cell. Um, uh, with flooded lead acid batteries, especially lead antimony batteries, bubbling is good. Um, I and I've seen batteries. It looks like it's boiling water inside the battery, and the battery's fine. Um, again, check your temperatures. Um, bubbling is not a problem. The gassing is not a problem. What is a problem is what is gassing. When a battery gasses, uh, two gases are leaving the battery, and that's hydrogen and oxygen. Um, oxygen, you know, really not a big deal, especially in those kinds of concentrations. But unfortunately, hydrogen is very explosive, and uh, especially if it's in a tight, confined area, uh, you want to make sure that uh, you've got uh, active ventilation or enough ventilation that turns on soon enough to, to remove the hydrogen. Um, uh, generally, while you're charging, the bubbling should be relatively uniform. Again, every battery has uh, its own internal resistance, and so it's the, the, the amount the battery, battery bubbles is going to vary depending on what that internal resistance is. So uh, here's an example of an overcharged, uh, overheated battery. Uh, you can see uh, we've got this uh, plate here. Uh, relatively even grid wear, granted, yeah, it's a little dark, it's definitely been used, but if we look at this, um, you can see, especially this portion of, the, of your grid, you're actually losing active material. Um, uh, usually what you see when you start seeing act, you're losing active material on the battery is you'll see the little black uh, flex uh, or your electrolyte will actually turn uh, almost a chocolate milk look consistency. Um, that's not good, especially uh, a lot of times you'll see it mix up a lot during charging. Uh, you give it a couple hours of rest and it goes away, you're probably fine. But if it's like this all the time, um, this is not good. Um, that is a battery that's pretty much uh, in the process of failing, um, if, not, if it hasn't already failed. Um, stratified batteries. Uh, uh, what a lot of folks will do is they'll go and they'll top off, they'll go to the battery bank, they'll see that the water is low, they'll top off the batteries up to 100% full, and then they'll start taking specific gravity measurements. You want to be careful with that because um, you want to you look at your specific gravity measurements before you top off, 
Uh, you want to top off at least half to part way and then charge and then maybe top off one more time after the charge is finished. Um, and the reason for that is, is that the battery could look stratified. So if you have a battery, say you've got a customer with three batteries or four batteries in one cell, it measures zero. Uh, if it's measuring or a specific gravity of one, if it's measuring a specific gravity of one, either that cell is totally 100% complete dead and you should actually be seeing about four volts across the battery if it's a six volt cell. Or that cell is the, has become stratified, which means the acid has settled down to the bottom of the battery while the water is floating on top and all you're doing is measuring the, the water. So it's a good idea if you, if you think you have, if you're measuring specific gravities and you get specific gravities of you know just dead one or very, very low while the rest of the battery bank is okay, run the battery through a, a, a high bulk or you could even do like a, half hour to, to 60 minute long of uh, equalization uh, and that'll help stir it up a little bit and then if you remeasure and your specific gravity comes back uh, you should be good. A um, couple troubleshooting examples, a um, uh, couple differences. Old batteries, old batteries generally will be less resistive to voltage changes which means that when you charge a older battery the voltage is going to rise much faster than if the battery was new. Um, uh, if you have an old battery that's sulfated, this is going to exacerbate problems with sulfation. Um, again, uh, this usually manifests itself when the customer realizes they don't have capacity, generator starts in the middle of the night, yada, yada, yada. Um, uh, you know, uh, so what you should be doing is when you, on old batteries, you really need to be looking at improving the charging process. In most cases, with most customers, the the chargers are uh, the PV arrays are well under designed because of the cost of PV. Most of these systems were installed. Most of the, the battery based systems were installed, you know, while PV was expensive. Now PV in the last five or six years, PV has gotten so inexpensive that you could throw a five kilowatt array on an 800 amp hour battery bank and be fine. Um, so. The, the, it's actually cheaper to buy the panels and make sure you, your batteries stay at a higher state. Um, new batteries, new batteries are going to resist voltage changes more, so it's going to take longer to get to that bulk charging stage. Um, uh, and this is where here's one of the major dilemmas: is is that if it takes longer to get through that bulk charging stage, your overall charge process is going to be longer. If you d don't design the PV array large enough to handle that battery bank, if it's not if your renewable sources aren't at least 10, 15% of your battery bank capacity, then what's gonna happen is, is that the customer has to run the generator and they have to run the generator for the absorption times to get those batteries into a decent state of health or they're gonna start losing capacity fairly, fairly quickly. Um, uh, one of the reasons why I'm talking about old batteries and new batteries is that when a manufacturer replaces, a, say, a warranty battery a year into an installation, what happens is is that the the old batteries will 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 rise in voltage much faster than the newer batteries, and so the newer batteries, when you say you replace a battery or two in a string, the newer batteries will sulfate to the level of the oldest batteries. So that's 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 okay because basically what you're doing is you're sacrificing that new battery for the old batteries. Um, High resistive batteries, a uh, high, res uh, 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 high resistive or sulfated battery will resist current. Uh, it will accept voltage, but it will resist current. Um, so again, high resistive batteries will trick chargers and especially state of charge meters to thinking batteries are fully 100% charged. Be very, very careful of that, that indamp one or two or three or 4% indamp setting uh, typically, I will usually set for Rolls batteries, end amps, or return amp settings at one to one to two percent max. Uh, and in some cases, especially with PV arrays, I will disable my end amp settings to make sure that I'm hitting my absorption times and I'm maximizing how much photovoltaic I'm, I'm running. Um, low resistance batteries. Basically, what that means is you've got an internal short. Uh, it could be a separator issue. Uh, 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 actually, go back to high resistive batteries. On high resistive batteries, what will happen is, is you'll start losing capacity. Specific gravities will all sag. On low resistive batteries, what will happen is, is you actually have a short internally. 
inside the battery. And what will happen there is the uh, 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 the what will happen with that short. What will happen with that short is the short will cause a problem. The short will cause an issue with uh, uh, it'll start eating up the current because the current's going to go to let, lead, past the least 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 resistance, and so your your the rest of the batteries will basically it could cause a excessive uh, SGs in the rest of the battery bank or cause problems. Um, so. Just to reiterate, data logging on your battery bank is very, very important. Um, you've got a data log. If you're not data logging your battery bank, if you're not taking your specific gravity measurements, not taking voltage measurements, you really don't know what's going on with the battery bank. Um, so it's very difficult to, 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 to do troubleshooting that way. Um, uh, when you do start troubleshooting and you are troubleshooting a system, the troubleshooting process can take three, four, five, six weeks while you are troubleshooting. Um, be careful with that um, because uh, um, you, you want to make sure that you understand that they've, you want to you, you want to make sure that they understand your end users or that you understand that you can take some time to troubleshoot. I've already talked about failure rates. Um, uh, typically, most battery manufacturers, uh, you know, they're less than a quarter percent in general. Um, when you go and install a system, users should have the tools and education to properly troubleshoot. Um, you don't have to go through this whole thing with them. You don't have to go through uh, everything, but it's a good idea to, to take your customer around your system and educate them where their disconnect breakers are, educate them what their bypass does, educate them how to use their voltmeter or a hydrometer or a refractometer. Um, teach them how you know to take the, the measurements, how to clean the, the hydrometer, uh, teach them specifically what what water to use. It's a good idea to do that because uh, you're not always going to be on site to take care of that for that customer. So be very careful with that. So 24 volt system. We've got uh, a 12 at 12 cells in this, and I've got some specific gravity measurements. Uh, so we're going to go over this real quick. Um, generally, uh, battery one through 12 specific gravities. Uh, if someone sends me this, the, the, the specific gravity measurement, then, then I start to really question what they're doing because they're either they're perfect or um, they're uh, not quite being on the up and up. Um, typically, you won't see this in a system. Uh, what you normally see in a system is this. Uh, this is a pretty common measurement where you see uh, a 1260 measurement, 1265, 1265. 260, 262, you know, 265. Uh, voltage is kind of fluctuating all over the place a little bit. Uh, this is pretty common. Um, it's not a big deal. This is, you know, this is what I would consider probably a good or bottom end of the good borderline scale. Um, uh, the problem here is that we have we have generally uh, 1260, 1270 specific gravities, 1270. And we have one 12:30. Okay, my 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 resting voltage is a little low. The rest of my batteries. Uh, this battery now goes on what I call a watch list. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start keeping an eye on this battery over the next few months. Uh, uh, I might raise up my 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 absorption voltage two tenths, four tenths of a volt. Extend my absorption time out a little bit. Um, and and what and and if I continue to see a fall off, maybe a month do a real quick short hour, two hour long equalization at 30, 30, or at 31, 32 volts. See what that does to it. If that battery continues to not to not try to catch up with the rest of the battery bank, then indeed you do have uh, that would be a battery I would call uh, a, a replacement, a battery that's in the process of failing, and that's something you want to get out before it fails because once it fails. It starts to cause it can it can cause problems with the rest of the battery bank, so watch out for that. Um, the next battery bank, what would be wrong here? Um, generally, what's wrong with, with this battery bank is is if we look at our specific gravities. So I'll get out my highlighter, highlighter again. So we look at our specific gravities, and generally our specific gravities are all within 15, 20 points of each other. Uh, my voltages are all relatively close to each other. 
um, I guarantee you that this customer is using the battery bank heavier than at, than what you designed or their charging sources aren't operating as efficiently as designed. And so, or they might have a problem with the PV array or they might have a problem with connections. Um, this customer needs to do a couple things. They need to look at their charging parameters, adjust the charging parameters up, uh, lengthen their absorption times or raise their charging set points. You need to start looking at your battery cable connections, your connections in general to make sure you've got good clean connections. Um, uh, and tight connections, maybe back off your connections and retight them to make sure that what's going on with the system. So just a couple of things that, that could go, be going on here, but is this a warranty? This specific issue is not a warranty. These batteries are not failing because they've got a, a failed or a defective cell. These batteries are failing because generally they're being undercharged as a whole, and this is not a manufacturing defect. It's a defect in how the customer is using the system, and it's a defect on on, on what's going on with the with the operation of the system. Um, here's another battery bank. Uh, we've got specific gravities, you know, 210, 230, 250, 215, 250, uh, 210. Again, this battery bank is being undercharged, but I've it's been undercharged long enough now that I have very large discrepancies in my specific gravities. 30, 40, 50 points in specific gravities, okay? These are not just made up. These are actual testing reports that I've gotten from customers in the fields, okay? How I would fix this, how I would start fixing this is that I would not immediately go and equalize the living daylights out of the batteries. Stop getting out of that. Stop, get, get yourself out of the habit of going and hitting that EQ button. EQing is not good for batteries. Um, EQing is, is comparable to, to your training for a marathon. You're, you're, you're running, you know, five to eight kilometers a week or five to eight kilometers a day. You skip Tuesday and Tuesday and Wednesday because you've got main meetings. And so on Thursday, you decide you're going to run, you're going to run 15 or 18 kilometers. That's not the way to make up the mileage. Um, same thing with equalization. Your equalization, you're not going, by going through and cooking this battery bank, you're not going to be doing any good. What I would do with this battery bank is I would raise up my charging parameters. I would bump up my, my charging voltages, probably two to four to six tenths of a volt. I'd add at least 60 to 90 minutes to my overall absorption times. And I would focus on doing two to three weeks of cycling. Every day, every other day, doing a 20 to 30% depth of discharge cycle and recharge. And after two weeks, if your specific gravities rise and they get closer to each, to each other, then leave it alone. Continue to operate that way, but make sure you check your water more often because you're charging heavier. If the specific gravities don't recover, you know, or you still have wide, you know, you still have wide varying uh, specific gravities, that is when you need to kick it with a, a 2.58 to 2.65 volts per cell equalization. Try to do a longer, lower voltage charge than higher, shorter time, or higher, or higher voltage, shorter charges. More often, the batteries are going to react to it much better. So the, the next one, uh, again, this is a live specific gravity report that I've gotten from a customer. Um, all my specific gravities are all in the literal toilet. Uh, we're talking 1140s, 1160s, 1150s. Every one of these specific gravities is horrible. My voltages are all in the 1270 range or 1.70, or 1.60. Um, uh, this is severe deficit charging, deficit cycling. This battery, this battery bank has been abused. It hasn't been taken care of. It hasn't been charged. Um, again, with this battery bank, two, four, six tenths of a volt, higher absorption settings, longer absorption periods. I might even adjust my charge controllers so they never go to float. Um, you know, you've got a lot of charging. Ideally, you take this battery out, this battery bank out, and you put it into a grid source charger to get the battery back to a health. This is not a warranty failure. This battery bank is a complete and utter abuse of the battery bank. Um, these batteries, it, 
being held this low, again, water is soluble or lead is soluble in water. If you're going to hold your specific gravities at these low points for extended periods of times, uh, those you're, you're actually losing uh, plate. You're, you're shedding your plates is what you're doing. You're causing plate shedding. Uh, that's going to kill your batteries. So, um, so oh, geez, I went almost a full hour. Uh, I, guess, I guess I talked way too long. Uh, hopefully, this was beneficial for you. If you have any questions, uh, again, I don't see any questions in the question pane. Um, uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure exactly what's going on there. Uh, but if you have any questions, feel free to you can send me an email at, at steveatsret.com. Um, uh, just real quick, my next webinar is Troubleshooting 2. Uh, I'm going to go over a proper field, basically what I call the poor man's load test. Uh, I'm going to go over how to conduct the load test. Uh, I'm planning on holding that same time uh, on Thursday, September 1st, between 10 and 11 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Um, uh, go ahead and scratch this. Next, the next webinar, we are going to hold. We are not going to hold on the Google Plus page. Uh, I, we are going to hold this on the, uh, 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 as of this morning, I noticed that uh, YouTube was doing a uh, uh, live webinars like Google, Google, Google Plus or Google Air. Um, so it will be on the uh, uh, YouTube site. I will send everybody uh, that is uh, that I send invites to this one to that. Um, and so you should get those here in the next week. Um, again, my contact information, uh, steve at Uh My direct number is the 206 number. I'm based in Seattle, and you can also, if you're in Canada, you can dial me at the 800 number or the 902 number. Um, if you have any questions, feel free. Do not hesitate to send me an email. I'd be more than happy to, to, to answer your questions for you. Uh, you can rewatch this on YouTube if you just go to our Rolls Battery YouTube website. Uh, you can rewatch this and all my past ones and all my future ones uh, on uh, YouTube. Uh, again, thanks everybody. Oh, I do have a question. Is 1290 uh, way too high for a specific gravity? Uh, 1290 is high, um, but uh, uh, 1290, uh, 1290 specific gravity, um, I would probably back off your voltage or your your absorption voltage or your absorption time. I would I would drop your absorption time for by 15 minutes to a, to a half hour. Uh, and see what that does. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, 1.290 is a bit high. It's not something to be worried about. But uh, once you get above the 1300s, you've got some problems. But uh, uh, 1290, I would uh, back off your charging voltages. Um, the other thing to be careful of is that some uh, hydrometers, specifically the plastic box type hydrometers, they will actually they will also measure about 15 to 20 points high. So if you're using an automotive hydrometer, uh, a lot of times you can you can get a little bit of a high uh, specific gravity. So be careful there. Uh, thanks for the question, Roy. Hopefully that answered that. Hopefully that answered you. I'll send you an email on the side just to make sure that makes sense. So um, it just popped up. So, anyways, um, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, I want to apologize for uh, uh, going too uh, going too long. Uh, again, if you have any other further questions, feel free to send me an email at steveatsret.com. Thank you. Have a good day.